So that was generalizability. The other thing that I think if you jump ahead to reporting your results, you might want to think about is um, are there things that might bias the results and invalidate them? So bias is kind of a systematic inaccuracy in a measurement in one direction. So one sort of common cause of bias is a shared environment. And uh, I've said this about that hen housing study. You know, you look at a certain group of animals with give them one intervention at one farm and then another group of animals at a different farm, they've got a different intervention. That's not really a good design at all because the farms might be quite different in how they run and they might cause your um, difference in results rather than the, um, the intervention, the treatment effect. <coughs> And if exactly the same thing goes for cages. If you have all the animals having one treatment in one cage and all them having another treatment in another cage, there, there could be, might not be, but you might want to consider there could be cage conditions, for example, the amount of the temperature they're at, the amount of daylight they get, um, that are going to affect the measurements and bias the results. And even if you don't think they will affect the measurements, when you write up your studies, your reviewer might think, well, you only had one cage or one farm that might um, have biased your results and you might have to argue carefully as to why you don't think it has. So it doesn't just apply to animals. Um, there might be a situation if you're here um, studying whether temperature affects cell development. And I think there's a study, a big study looking at Rosalind freezers going on at the moment, seeing if um, how cold they need to be but here it, we're looking at incubators. You've got two incubators at different temperatures. You're looking at tissue cultures. There's a, quite a big sample of cultures in each of the incubators. But it could be that the incubators themselves are operating under different conditions for some reason. So the um, individual tissues are not independent. So ideally you'd have the incubators, different incubators sampled to avoid that possibility that um, the results due to other factors about the incubators. And another thing that people don't often think about is they can be biased due to allocating your units haphazardly to the interventions. So if you think about allocating maybe kind of mice to particular interventions, you might have a container full of mice and pick them out one by one and you might give the first 10 the first treatment and the second 10, the second treatment. But it's quite possible that there's a bias in picking out the animals, you know, the more aggressive ones might kind of, you might reach from quicker, even though you think you're picking them out at random, they, they, you might get a particular set of mice more likely to come out first than the others. So that potentially can cause a bias. Another thing that can um, introduce a bias is being influenced by prior knowledge of the intervention particularly in something like animal behaviour studies, if there's two groups of animals and you're assessing how they're behaving in their cages and you know what's happened to each of the groups, you might be more likely to observe higher or lower results in one group than another. And that's also the case when you come to analyse the data, even if it's somebody else analysing the data, if you know what the different interventions were, there might be a kind of bias in how you're interpreting the results. And there are things we can do to avoid bias. Um, the first is something called randomization, and that's to randomize the experimental units to the interventions. So, for example, if we were allocating animals to interventions, we would do it in a random order. We wouldn't put the first 10 or so to one intervention and the next 10 to the other. So that's a, a key way to avoid bias. Sometimes there are a nuisance factors such as that we're not really interested in analysing or drawing conclusions about, such as cage or the days on which the experiment was done on. And it's sometimes possible to build that into the design using something called a randomised block design, which title isn't really very helpful. And the other key way is blinding. If you know what intervention you've used, you could be influenced in how you analyse the data or even how you record the results. But if you can avoid knowing that by blinding yourself to the intervention, that can help reduce bias. So it will avoid any unconscious favouring of a preferred outcome. And like I say, that goes when you're analysing the data as well. 
in clinical research, it's much more common to sort of for people not to know what the interventions are. Even at the analysis stage, the interventions are just called, sort of called A and B. And if it's possible to blind everyone to that, um, it makes the study more watertight. And in fact, yeah, in clinical trials, quite often they're described as double blind um, because both the researcher and the analyst doesn't know what the intervention is, and they're called double blind randomised trials. So you know they're the seen as a good quality trial and I think that hopefully it's going to come in more in um, animal and sort of biological studies as well. So thinking about randomising, it's actually, um, it sounds, oh dear, you know, you might think that's too complicated for me to do, but you can actually do it very easily. I mean, you could if you've just got two groups, I suppose, toss a coin, but um, you can set up a random order quite easily in Excel. If we take an example, we're thinking about comparing two groups and we're looking at um, rats and thinking about whether infection with worms affects brain development. If we assume we've done some sample size calculations and we're going to have five control rats that don't get given worms and then five that are infected with worms, then we simply just, first of all in Excel, list out five in one group, five in the other group. And then you can generate a random number. There's various ways you can do this um, in Excel. The, this rand function will just give you a set of random numbers between noughts and one. So these are the numbers that were generated. And by sorting those numbers, sorting the rows by these numbers, it'll put them in a random order. So we'll do that next. We've now sorted by that random number we had here. And we've got a random order for the, the worms and the control group. And we can allocate sort of incremental rat numbers to that. So that tells us, you know, the first rat we, we select will get the worms. The second one gets control. third one is a control and so on. So that's put them in a random order and ensured that we're not, there's not any bias in how we're allocating the intervention.